whether you like it or not, it looks like UAVs could be coming to a city, a state, or a private company near you. Anyone can own one of these, anyone can operate one of these. These tiny flying robots are equipped to take photos and video. Just today, a tourist crashed one into a hot spring at Yellowstone National Park. buy them online for several hundred dollars, but right now there's a lot of gray area in terms of privacy. And only on 7 News. Turn on the news and you're seeing more and more stories about drones and the stunning images they capture in a new dynamic way. Imagine having a tripod that you can put anywhere you want, literally anywhere, inside, outside, next to people. This is really going to change how we view stuff. We're not talking about military drones carrying weapons but drones that look like remote control helicopters. And when you see what they can do, it's no wonder everyone from Amazon to police to filmmakers, even farmers, are lining up to use them. It's a revolution that we're experiencing right now and being able to go out quickly and very conveniently fly. Washington is at the epicenter of this booming drone industry. The top drone makers in our backyard. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars every year in procuring parts uh, from Washington State, and then inject you know hundreds of millions of dollars a year in just salary alone. Building, testing, and inventing brand new ways to utilize these aircraft it's all happening right here. Using collaborating robots together, whether they're air or ground, we see it's really going to be the future in, in most everything that's done. But for every innovative use, there's also confusion. Where can they fly? Who can fly them? Then there's fear over spying, privacy, and what Big Brother government or your next door neighbor can and should be allowed to watch. It's not just watch you like I can watch somebody across the park, it's watch you with a, a telescopic lens from a quarter mile away or a half a mile away. It's watching you in this way that there isn't necessarily a technological equivalent to that we just deal with in, in regular society. It's a concern that's about to grow more intense. In 2015, the skies are fair game. The FAA will open up commercial airspace to drones. That means 30,000 drones likely buzzing around the country by the end of this decade. That will happen. That will happen in the next few years, and it's coming. The issue is at the center of a heated debate in Washington state. No drones! From protests to a governor's veto. I'm very concerned about the effects of this new technology. There's even a ban on state agencies using them. Senate will be in order. With Washington lawmakers poised to tackle the issue again, setting rules for who can use drones, when, and the reasons why many are questioning the future of flight plans in Washington. It really requires good coordination, fairly good eyesight, and uh, nerves of steel. And, and, uh, I don't do so well on those three counts, but I'm stubborn. If you've ever seen a drone buzzing the sky... We consider a successful flight one that ends not in a crash. There's a good chance it's flown by someone who's discovered a new hobby. My name's Carl Franz, and I'm trying to be retired. Okay, we're gonna go up. I've been flying uh, just over a year, and I got into it because my wife and I have a property with an amazingly beautiful wetland. When I flew over our wetland for the first time, a thousand feet out and back, and found a beaver dam that's probably a hundred years old, huge, never seen it before. That gave me a thrill that I still get when I fly. This former travel writer. I don't film wildlife because I, I don't like to harass them. Now spends his time filming nature from the sky. It's just quite an interesting and I think can potentially productive hobby, especially if you're if you're fortunate to be able to do it the way I do it. I mean, gosh, how, how good can it get? I've, I've, I've got the hobby. My wife doesn't yell at me for spending the money. And <laughs> it's a hobby that's as expensive as you make it. You can buy now the first generation Phantoms are going for as little as $400. The beautiful red waterproof ladybug, uh, those 
retail ready to fly for over 3,000. If you want to get a little crazy as a hobbyist, there's no limit to what you can spend. They can't have something more intimidating. This Phantom drone, the most popular model in the hobby market. This is the gimbal system, so this is basically just to keep stuff steady. And a favorite of Bellingham videographer and student Max Romy. All right. All right, that yeah, looks like it's working. As a videographer, I'm interested in showing people a story through my eyes, and my eyes are my camera. Oh, that's very sweet. So to have something like this just opens up a world of possibilities. I primarily focus on running videos. You know, as a runner, that's my passion, and that's, that's what I like to show. And having access to something like this just changes it. As long as you don't hit people, you can follow people, you know, two feet behind their back and then shoot up 500 feet. So it's really a dream come true for a videographer. We might record the first <laughs> mid -air mid crash. Mid yeah. <laughs> Max and Carl are part of Washington's growing hobbyist community, building and flying drones for fun, often in parks like this, where there's less to crash into. The first time I flew it here, I was 100 feet in the air up there when I realized, I wonder what's happening with the battery. It dropped straight down and hit the ground, and uh, yeah, I broke the landing gear, so uh, that's why I get a hillbilly fix, because this landing gear is quite expensive. They fly under the Federal Aviation Administration's model aircraft rules, frequently referred to as the FAA hobby rules. Another perfect landing. <laughs> <laughs> Drones must fly under 400 feet, five miles away from airports, stay within line of sight, weigh less than 55 pounds, and cannot fly for commercial purposes. Olympic National Park recently joined a long list of national parks banning drones. The FAA says big congested cities like Manhattan are also off limits because of airspace restrictions. But otherwise, the sky is the limit in most places, under 400 feet at least. As a hobbyist, I could fly this anywhere I want, and the FAA is not going to do anything to me. There's no like FAA police out there. But I would say that it's the people that are flying these that really are policing it. You know, I'm, I'm keeping others who are flying these in check, and others are keeping me flying it in check because they don't want anybody in the community to ruin it for the rest of them. It's a really cool hobby, a lot of possibility, but a couple mistakes could really bring down the hammer on everybody. When I come here and there are people, I go way over to the other side and I keep a very low profile. I don't fly over people or near them. And there's a lot of controversy about that. I'm concerned like a lot of the hobbyists about the, the perception of these things as, as a great invaders of privacy. And I would no more try to invade somebody's privacy with this than I would shoot a shotgun off in their backyard or whatever but there are some irresponsible people flying them. There's no doubt about it. So we're gonna run into more negative reports, and I just hope that those negative reports don't overshadow what can the positive uses of these things. And I saw it and I stopped and paused and was like, what the heck is that? Because I'm not used to seeing something like that out there. An eerie side outside a Seattle apartment building. One of the most widely publicized reports happened in Seattle, where a woman told Como News she spotted a drone outside her 26-story apartment window. Turns out it was a Portland company taking photos to show the view for a new 20-story building. People have mixed reactions to seeing hobby drones in the sky, as TVW discovered when flying at a public park. I think at first I say, wow, that's kind of cool. And then I say, are they taking pictures of me? Is this for like Amazon? Are they going to deliver packages with these kind of things? Yeah, it kind of freaked me out when I was sitting over there looking at it. I was like, what is that thing over there? It's not a helicopter, is it? What's he going to do with the video? You know, because if you take somebody's pictures, usually you ask them or, you know, you get somebody's permission. Right. So what is he videotaping? I guess we're just used to it. Yeah. I think it's, it'd be fun. It'd be like Instagram selfie with my drone. With the consent of the House, we'll advance to the seventh order of business, hearing no objections so ordered. Here at Washington State Capitol in Olympia, there have been attempts to put more rules on hobbyists. I'm not sure it's going to go. Spearheaded by Democratic State Representative Jeff Morris. Well, I'm having battery issues, oh. so 
I bought one of these drones just to experiment what we were trying to regulate. And uh, my second experience, I lost control of it and was lucky I didn't hurt somebody. And I immediately thought, oh gosh, what kind of insurance should I have before I started to fly this? Representative Morris introduced a bill that would have shielded private property from the eyes of drones. The bill we looked at, if you're flying a, an unmanned aerial vehicle in a park like we're in here today, that's okay to do. You can record it, record what's going on if you want. Um, even though some people felt uncomfortable about that, it's a public space. What we said though is if you have a private property, you don't have the right to record people's private property without their permission. You know, that's going to stop the, the kind of voyeurism with drones potentially of in the case of the Seattle incident, hovering outside a 26th uh, you know, story apartment building, you have a certain sense of privacy that that would have been illegal, it would have been a new crime. The bill passed overwhelmingly out of the House. Senate will be in order. But died in the Senate and never became law. Morris still thinks the potential for abuse is huge. Definitely all the abusive things that people will feel their privacy was violated is going to happen in that hobbyist space. He says people have an expectation to privacy in their own homes. My building, we have skylights all over the place. I, I don't put curtains on my skylights. If there was a helicopter over your house, you would know that it was there. I found with the, the, the Amazon you know, Phantom drone that I, I bought to experiment with, that I, I don't, uh, some of them are really loud. Some of them are not so loud if you're more than you know, 20 yards away, you're, you're not going to hear it in an environment with lots of other ambient background noise. In the same way that you can abuse a lot of other things to spy on people's privacy, you can abuse these. Hobbyists argue that laws should focus on the people who are spying, not the drone itself. That's not what I'm interested in. I think the majority of people are not interested in that, especially because it wouldn't work very well. You have to be very distracted not to see these. They sound like a lawnmower. They are not small. They're bright white so that I can see them. They're not exactly a spy plane. I mean, they're, they're, they're big. The, um, the Eagle Tree looks like it could be happier. I'm getting a graphics error, but all the instrumentation looks good. Amid this spying debate, some hobbyists are trying to educate the public and lawmakers about how drones could be used for good. Bingo, we're up. We've got six satellites, 1.4. I'm Patrick Sherman. I'm Brian Zweisna. And together we are the Roswell Flight Test Crew. We're hobbyists who build and fly multi-rotor aircraft with the primary goal of sort of showing their potential benefits to society. Our areas of particular interest are helping first responders and scientific research. Let's go. The duo gained fame on the internet for these catchy videos, something that began when they started flying demonstrations for Washington firefighters three years ago. Longview was actually, it's kind of, kind of has a special place in our hearts because it was the very first public safety we ever did. You can put that thing in the air and see something that no one else can see. Uh, with a FLIR imager, you can see right through the smoke. Or you could see where the guys are on the roof to see, hey, there's a hot spot there, don't go over there and they can tell that ahead of time in real time so the incident commander can say it's unsafe to go here or it's safe to go there or go now, whatever. So it's information they don't normally have. And they said, you know, go to town, film whatever else you want. So we made our first you know, video there, which was basically just a burn to learn, uh, an old apartment complex that had been decommissioned just being yeah, burned pretty, to the Yeah, pretty ground. big one too. Yeah, yeah. So that kind of, you know, lit off the flare and got us attention on the internet. That's where we started to get our reputation is, oh, the drone guys who do the fire stuff. They say privacy is not an issue when flying with firefighters. If your house is on fire, you're less concerned if somebody happens to videotape you than that the firefighters help you, you know, put that out. But when flying for fun... Hey guys, you want to see what it sees? Using first-person goggles to see what the drone sees, they almost always draw a crowd. We have people that walk by and go, oh, you could be spying on us. And we throw them under the goggles and go, look, you really can't see detail at this kind of distance. It's more like for the fun of it. If you're, like you're up in a jetliner, you can't see what's going on to the ground. With the wide angle view that we have on the cameras, you really can't see a lot of detail. Unless you're on top of the person, then of course you're right there and they, they can tell you're there. As for rules for hobbyists. Regulate behavior, not technology. To my mind, if I'm violating someone's personal privacy, it doesn't matter whether I do that with a camera with a long lens or with a you know, camera on the end of a stick or with a multi-rotor aircraft. I'm violating the personal's, person's privacy, and that's the behavior which should be punished. They say rulemaking is best left to the Federal Aviation Administration, which is developing rules for small drones by the end of 2014. We don't want a patchwork of rules in different states, because we live in Oregon, but we travel to Washington very frequently and fly there, and 
I'd hate to end up memorizing one set of rules for Oregon, another set for Washington, a third one when we go to California. I mean, I think and I hope that most of the people doing this are, are sensible and show good judgment, and hopefully that's enough. But I, I would like somebody to have some teeth to, to smack those people who do get out of line. As drone operators wait for the FAA. There is one group growing impatient, those who want to fly drones for commercial purposes. Photographers, filmmakers, journalists, and real estate agents. You can demonstrate the house pretty good with traditional photography, but to capture really the location, that's where people do the drive-bys and they want to see who's next door or where does the house sit in relation to uh, the physical attributes of the community. There's really not a better way to to illustrate it. Many real estate agents like Eric Larson use drones to market homes, a practice Especially. that's technically against FAA guidelines, but those rules are in question. A federal judge says the rules are only voluntary and can't be enforced, but the FAA is appealing. That ambiguity has professionals in limbo. I think it's going to become uh, pretty mainstream within the next year for the real estate industry. I think it's just going to be something people expect. Online, people love them because they can see what's around. It's new, so people never have that have had that perspective of a, of a home. Can you see it? No. But like any new technology, can't see it. <sighs> it sometimes has its hiccups. So it drifted off in the neighborhood and probably ran out of battery and it landed somewhere. Hopefully it didn't cause any damage anywhere. I'll probably post some signs around the neighborhood. Okay. Without FAA guidelines, real estate agents follow their own code of ethics. I look at it and say, if, if I live next door, would I be okay with that? Uh, as well as if I'm the seller or if I'm a buyer, does this give me a good picture of, of what's here? You know, it's a great tool for realtors to take pictures of your house, but... That worries Representative like Morris, who thinks uniform guidelines are necessary. It'd be great if the Washington Realty Association had a code of ethics for them, not just, a, you know, situational ethics, kind of one by one. If a realty firm takes pictures of your house, you know, how long do they keep that information before they dump it? Can you see my security system in the pictures? Uh, you know, there's all sorts of other things that people need to be aware of that is being shared. With the national airspace scheduled to open to drones in 2015, the FAA is under pressure from Congress to sort out the rules, not just for small drones that fly under 400 feet, but bigger, more expensive professional drones that can go much higher and are big business in Washington state. Bidgen, Washington sits on the Columbia River Gorge, known as the windsurfing capital of the world. What most people don't know. Ready to launch. Launch, launch, launch. It's also the drone manufacturing hub of Washington State. Here you'll find about a dozen companies with ties to the drone industry. Boeing's in situ is leading the way. The first move started today. So there's maybe six or eight people. You can see the production floor. It's doubling, if not tripling, our capacity of what we have in Stevenson. In situ is laying down roots in Bingen. Kind of the area that's not uh, been painted with epoxy floor sealer. That is our high speed lanes, so that's where aircraft will move down. Opening this new 120,000 square foot factory. This is all of our shelving for our inbound and outbound goods. If you were to lay out each shelf individually, it would be about two miles of shelving capacity. Soon to be stocked with in situ's two signature products, the 45-pound Scan Eagle carrying a day and night camera and the 135-pound Integrator with cameras, surveillance, and communications equipment. Starting at $100,000, these unmanned systems fly as high as 19,000 feet and can stay in the air for 24 hours. They're mostly used by the military for surveillance and reconnaissance missions. In the old days, you know, saving Private Ryan and all that, you'd say, okay, I need some volunteers. You go over the hill and tell me what's going on. The enemy is over the hill. Well, only you get 10 volunteers, only five of them come back. Nowadays, we don't do that anymore. We use technology and we say we need to see what's going on over that hill before we're going to send our precious commodity, our soldiers, men and women, over there to do battle. We want to know what's going on ahead of time. It's been very successful. All those babies. <laughs> uh, I don't see them though. 
It's also drawn attention from anti-war protesters. This activist video is from a confrontation outside in situ headquarters in 2010. Anybody that's, that is against the drones killing innocent civilians, if any of you want me to leave, if any of you want me to leave, I will leave. The protesters met by an equal number of supporters, there to point out the economic turnaround in situ brought to the former timber town. Ten years ago, Clickitat County was dead last in income per capita in the state of Washington. Last. If you drove down Bingen and White Salmon back then, all of the facilities, all the buildings were boarded up, there were no jobs. And then along came in situ and, and they had the new, new technology that the military needed desperately. Now, Klickitat County, number two behind King County, income per capita, miracle. More than 1,000 people work in the drone industry here with an average salary of $68,000 a year. Once the FAA allows drones to fly at the same time as planes, Washington is predicted to be one of the biggest economic winners in the nation, second only to California. That's 4,000 jobs and $760 million in total economic impact by the end of this decade. It's a future in situ is counting on. So this is us right here. We're standing under these trailers right here. Um, this is the hangar where we keep uh, the airplanes and our ground equipment and stuff. In situ's unmanned systems are flown by test pilots like Danny Anslinger. The airplane's flying around in a circle right here. Well, if I wanted to fly around in a circle over there, I could just pick the airplane up click and drag, drop it there, and then it's going to fly over there. A former corporate pilot who had to adjust routes. to a new way so of flying. You're still actively working with the airplane, but it, the autopilot does the flying part of it. We don't actually, you know, use, use our thumbs on a joystick or anything to control the airplane. I'm just commanding the autopilot. When I was doing manned airplane flying, it was, you know, learning to fly by the feel of the airplane. And with this, I started to have to learn a lot more about accelerometers and sensors and gyros and all the different components that make up the autopilot so that when things start to go wrong, you can sense, you know, and understand what's happening and know the, the right course of action to take. Hey Danny, I'm gonna sneak over underneath you. Um... The FAA authorizes these drones to fly up to 3,000 feet just for testing before being shipped, mostly to military customers. In the early 2000s, and especially after 9-11, uh, uh, we found ourselves very much focused on the military market. Our, our customers needed this capability. It was an organic ISR asset that would help us in Iraq and Afghanistan. Some of the notable uh, milestones with uh, Scanigo were in 2004, uh, when we supported the Marine Corps in the Battle of Fallujah. With the Navy, we were actually able uh, to use Scan Eagle in support uh, of the Navy SEALs that were uh, chartered with uh, rescuing uh, Captain Phillips from pirates. As troops leave Afghanistan, in situ's President Ryan Hartman says the company is refocusing on the civilian market. The possibilities are endless. In situ is already flying a Scan Eagle in the Arctic for Conoco Phillips. Hartman also sees opportunities in agriculture, firefighting, and search and rescue, even bringing a scan eagle to the Oso mudslide to see if it could help. We were prepared to do is fly overnight when they couldn't fly a helicopter or a manned uh, platform. Being able to fly overnight and continue the search for people was something that we were prepared to do. Unfortunately, uh, situations on the ground and restrictions uh, on the ground didn't enable us to provide any kind of capability, but it showed that there was interest, there was a, a real capability that we could bring to the table. In situ was started by a couple of guys in a garage who liked to windsurf. There was a lot of technology that helped support our industry in uh, carbon fiber, which was used for the surfboard manufacturing at the time, and we were able to um, utilize those technologies here. It just kept growing and growing. Now other companies are here because of Insitu. At the very early onset of Insitu, uh, our focus was on creating what we called an ecosystem of suppliers and partners uh, for the use of uh, or for the application of unmanned aircraft. My name is Andy Mack. I'm the president and owner of Zephyr Incorporated. Zephyr assembles the retrieval equipment for the Scan Eagle. Basically it's a, uh, a crane on a, uh, on a trailer. Uh, it's got some rigging and uh, booms that uh, allow for the capture of the aircraft. As the company grew, uh, our company was able to continue to support their, uh, their products and their services. So we grew 
essentially grew right alongside of in situ and uh, we now have our own, uh, own facilities and employ 17, 18 people. This area has just been uh, a very attractive place to come and live and work for people in all different uh, fields of either manufacturing or software as well as engineering. We have literally thousands of jobs, not hundreds, but thousands of jobs that depend on this industry. This is the aircraft we're developing. It should go into service next year in 2015. Tad McGear was one of Insitu's original founders in 1991. There's what the ACLU would call the evil eye. He broke away in 2005 and started a new company called Aerovel. This aircraft could fly nonstop from the west coast to Hawaii. It can climb like a helicopter for a few hundred feet and then uh, it dives and turns into a normal aircraft. Once it turns into a normal aircraft, its fuel consumption is quite low and it can fly for a couple of days. McGear predicts his biggest customers will be tuna fishermen who currently use helicopters to look for schools of fish. Everybody in the industry has a personal story, at least one, of somebody getting killed in a helicopter. Not a statistical story, a personal story, somebody they know getting killed in a helicopter. So of course, if you come along and say, here's something that'll find fish, it'll be cheaper, and you don't actually have to get killed. That sounds pretty interesting. <laughs> As companies in the gorge prepare for the commercial market, some professionals worry the perception and fear of drones, along with restrictive state laws, could hurt their industry. The fear about drones is really a misguided conversation. I think if we were really talking about the right thing, we'd be talking about the loss of our privacy. Nancy White is the CEO of another gorge company, Custom Interface. Obviously, there's good in protecting the public from the dangers of terrorists and this kind of thing, but the American public has a hard time understanding why their particular email is being gathered along with everyone else's in the country. You know, whether we're on our phones or using email, I think the American public has really become super sensitive to having this invasion, and so now, you know, the UAS systems has become that next thing that we all fear. But if we were really having the right conversation, it'd be about how do we protect our privacy? Rotors are engaged. While this drone may look and sound oh, like those flown off. for fun, there's one important difference. This one belongs to police. The zoom is actually all the way in right there. And uh, it gets us a good situational awareness, but we're not reading VINs or license plates or anything with this. The Seattle Police Department in 2012 became one of the first public agencies to acquire a drone, the Dragonflyer X6. As officers showed King 5 News, the drone is not armed and comes with three different cameras to watch crime scenes. But when the Seattle police attempted to hold community meetings to explain how they would use the drone. Not much to it, huh? The meeting was shut down by angry protesters. No drone! Who drowned out Assistant Chief Paul McDonough. All I'm trying to do is have a respectful conversation. Shouting about a loss of privacy. And fears of police abuse. Of course, this is going to be seen as a threat because you're already having a lot of killings. Uh, and violence within the community. Most people know drones to be objects of war that kill people abroad. So that's obviously gonna ruffle a few feathers when local police departments want to start getting them as well. Among those who oppose Seattle's drone program is Matthew Killigrew, a legal fellow with the Bill of Rights Defense Committee. I think that people were upset not just because of their um, experience, you know, their, their field of reference for drones being really dangerous and potentially lethal on the one hand, but for two, out of a deeply, just the deep creep factor of this idea that there is a drone that can watch you at any time. He says drones in the hands of government pose a threat to civil liberties. It becomes the most pronounced problem when the police do it, because at the end of the day, a hobbyist can take a picture and you may not like the fact that they take a picture and you can have a genuine fight about that, but all you're gonna have is a fight. The police do it, they can throw you in prison. Seattle's drone program also drew criticism from the American Civil Liberties Union, which says police never explained what they would do with the pictures collected. In that situation, you know, we, we engaged with the Seattle police. You know, we, we wanted to get a clearer picture of what they wanted to use the drones for. 
they didn't really have that picture. And as it turned out, uh, you know, the public outcry was strong enough that the mayor eventually ended up pulling the plug on the program. Uh, and now the drones have been uh, actually shipped down to the LAPD uh, for, for their use. Uh, so I think that's a very good cautionary tale of, of how not to acquire drones. Seattle police declined an interview with TVW saying, quote, the department no longer has UAVs and will not be using them lest there are changes in law and or public sentiment. Much of the public's perception of drones is undeniably tied to war. In the last five years, drone strikes have killed more than 2,000 people abroad. Unmanned aerial vehicles came about during World War I. The Kettering bug was the first. Propellers and a motor were attached to a warhead carrying 200 pounds of explosives. A short track served as a runway. After a rocky start, it finally took flight, delivering the bomb by cutting the engine and diving to Earth. Lessons learned from the Kettering bug help design more advanced unmanned aerial systems, including spy drones such as this Cold War era D-21B on display at Seattle's Museum of Flight. Today's military drones are smaller, faster, smarter, and come both armed and unarmed. The public perception is they're bad. You know, and they're bad because they kill people. And that's the military application. And we look at that and we go, yeah, they do kill people, but who, it's the bad guys. We're saving our soldiers' lives. My son's a corporal in the Marines. I want every absolute uh, technology available to save his life. But we want to take that technology and use it for positive purposes. Eric Folkstead is the president of the Cascade chapter of the Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International, the leading trade group for the industry. He says police departments would benefit from the technology. Law enforcement is a very risky job. Fighting crime is dangerous. And if there's a way that we can provide protection for our law enforcement officers who hundreds get killed every year needlessly, and if we can provide some form or some tool to help them uh, get a different perspective on the situation. If you've got a crime scene or you've got an active um, hostage situation where you need eyes in the sky, it's perfect for that and we can save lives doing that. We know we can and we have a bunch of engineers and scientists that are willing to provide this technology to law enforcement. The barriers to effective policing are not technological. Why do we need bigger earlier, more advanced, more terrifying, less accountable police technologies when it really seems like the problems with policing are in oversight. It's in policy decisions. The myth is that left-leaning organizations are the ones that, or people, are the ones that may have concerns, but, but the reality really is that um, Tea Party groups and many more groups have very strong concerns about this sort of technology. The Washington chapter of the Council on American Islamic Relations worries police will use drones to track local Muslims. We have a number of people who are being um, who, who complain of being held at the, at the border, um, at other places, and they have clean records, they're U.S. citizens, they're wondering why they're being flagged. They also wonder if their activities, they're active in interfaith, they're active in their mosques, whether their activities are being tracked, and that is rendering them, them on these lists. And that's why the concern came again to, to drones. As we know, they're, they're, they can be as small as a deck of cars, they can be parked on a windowsill or maybe on, a, on an electric wire. And so that was a concern, you know, when will these be used? How, how much suspicion can, ha, must there be for these to be used? Uh, and many more questions like that. It's that invasion of privacy tied with the power and authority to apprehend someone and take them into for questioning and have your life fall down. That's really the problem. What we don't want is for law enforcement to take that technology and go beyond the privacy limits. That's something where we need the legislature to define what is the limit for that technology. The speaker is about to open the roll call machine. Has Washington's legislature agreed that police need restrictions when it comes to drones. And in 2014, it passed a bill by Republican Representative David Taylor requiring search warrants to use them. Essentially, it was a blanket prohibition. It said, government, you can't use drones unless. Do I want the, the Yakima County Sheriff deploying a drone because they have a, a description of a vehicle of somebody who had just abdu abdu abducted a kid? Yeah. Absolutely, that, and that was built into the bill. Do I want or do I think the public wants uh, a drone flying up and down every single road looking for speeding violations? No, they want the government to save money, 
work efficiently and effectively and maintain their privacy while doing that. The bill also allowed state agencies to use drones in certain situations, like fighting fires and responding to natural disasters. Things that, that generally, quite frankly, number one, would save lives, but number two could save the state money. Good morning, uh, since, as we know, since... But before the law could take effect, Governor Jay Inslee rejected the bill. Today I'm vetoing this particular bill. I am also imposing, uh, until we get another crack at getting this right in the next legislative session, I am imposing a moratorium for all executive branch state agencies on the purchase or use of unmanned aircraft systems for the next 15 months. The governor says it was conflicting and ambiguous, but some lawmakers disagree and say they're prepared to go so far as to hold a vote to override the governor's veto, something that hasn't happened in 25 years. I'm really excited to work on this committee because I think we have a unusual, if not unique, opportunity to really write the best legislation on this issue in the nation. For now, state drones remain grounded, and a task force is meeting to come up with the framework for a new law. Unfortunately, now we're faced with, uh, instead of having at least a placeholder with, with the bill being, had it been signed into law, we have to, we start over essentially. It's also created some confusion among state agencies, says TVW discovered, when it asked to shoot video with a drone at the state capitol during off hours when no people were around. TVW is not a state agency. And the Capitol is public property where anyone is free to film. But still, the answer was no. The State Department of Enterprise Services responded by saying filming the campus may violate the privacy of tenants and visitors, pose an unnecessary public safety risk, and disrupt normal conduct of state business. So instead, TVW obtained permission to shoot this footage at a nearby private property. Washington state agencies may not be flying, but it's not hard to get an idea of how they could use the technology. It's made of a composite with a, what you see over here is actually Kevlar. For that, you just have to look to federal agencies. It's extremely durable, extremely durable. It's a very reliable system, uh, originally designed for the Army. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration is already flying drones over Washington state and has for years. All the environments that NOAA operates in for instance, the Pacific Northwest, like here, it has no problems whatsoever. Jarvis checked and centered. The 13-pound Puma is one of six purchased by NOAA in conjunction with the U.S. Army, only with a much different mission. Counting birds off Washington's Olympic coast. Surface nesting seabirds are what we're looking at here. So common murres and cormorants, gulls. Sue Thomas is a biologist with U.S. Fish and Wildlife. You can see the birds are nesting underneath these shrubs. Really great footage. You can see them moving around in the colony. No disturbance, no signs of disturbance here whatsoever. Birds are landing on the rocks as we're filming. Here's a tufted puffin, gulls. There's that puffin again, there's another puffin, there's another puffin. I just love this footage. At 200 feet in the air, the drone goes unnoticed by the birds, even capturing an eagle attack. Here's where the eagle is coming in. So you'll see it come across the screen here after these birds start jumping off. You also notice that they're flying down from the rock, which is another concern. There's the eagle, just flew over this way. And this essentially ended our survey for the day because, well, they didn't have any birds to look at. Really. This waterproof puma could someday replace manned flights for state and federal agencies. We've had some fatalities with fixed wing aircraft and other agencies within the state of Washington have had fatalities with helicopter surveys. So we're trying to keep people out of helicopters as much as possible. So when you put a UAV up in the air, you don't have anybody attached to that. Because of the offshore location, the mission isn't raising any privacy concerns. I'd like to have somebody head up this way. But other wildlife surveys have. This is Dave, how are we doing on 30, over. The goal of this mission is to count the elk population in the Skagit Valley. It's a population that has been increasing in recent years, and it's gotten to the point where uh, there are a number of um, conflicts associated with the population. We could cover this area in one flight. 
Uh, the question is whether or not we want to switch cameras. Okay. Western Washington University professor David Wallen is leading this research and working with the U.S. Geological Survey. They brought their uh, military surplus Ravens uh, made by Aero Environment. And these are uh, aircraft, they're fixed wing aircraft. They're about a, about a four foot wingspan. Uh, and they carry a variety of cameras, but we mostly just use GoPro cameras. Drop clear. Firing up. Firing up. After a local paper ran a story about the flight, Wallen got calls from Capitol staffers worried about privacy. One of the questions they asked, which I thought was quite legitimate, was, are you flying over private land? And no, we weren't. I, you know, I was sensitive to those privacy issues. But then he asked me uh, what I thought was a very odd question. He said, well, there's public access to that land, right? And I said, well, of course. So there's public roads on there, right? I said, well, of course. And he said, so a member of the public could potentially drive onto that property while you're doing your surveys and potentially could be photographed. And so he was very emphatic in stating that we needed to put up a sign at the entrance to this property, uh, instructing any member of the public or informing members of the public that we were doing these unmanned aircraft surveys for elk, and if they came onto the property, they might inadvertently be photographed, and if they had concerns about that, then they shouldn't come onto the property. I thought that was a little extreme, but we put the sign up. So that's just sort of one illustration of the, the concerns that people have over privacy. Wallen spent hours studying the footage, but the elk stayed hidden in the thick vegetation. You know, the first time you try anything, it hardly ever works, so we learned a lot and we do plan to go back and try it again. So you can cover a lot bigger study area with the uh, fixed wing. Using a new drone purchased by the university with cameras he hopes will do a better job at spotting the elk through the trees. So it's got sort of a uh, window in the front where you can have a camera pointing out the front and you can also have a camera that points straight down. It's going to be a few years down the road, but I'm confident that in the years to come, the use of unmanned aircraft for doing these kinds of wildlife surveys will become routine. Public drones may also someday become routine for search and rescue, mapping, weather monitoring, disaster response, and fighting fires. As wildfires blazed across eastern Washington this summer in one of the worst fire seasons yet, the Department of Natural Resources got permission from the FAA to deploy an in situ Scan Eagle drone to keep an eye on the disaster. But there remains debate about how drones used in these scenarios should be deployed. There are a lot of different circumstances in which I think the actual technology of the drone could be incredibly helpful, uh, if not life saving. But in the world of civil liberties, privacy protections, it's just sort of like the Wild West when it comes to stuff like that. And there's no regulation that's going to say that a drone that could be used for search and rescue on Tuesday isn't going to be used for an unwarranted search on Thursday. What we're most concerned about is the collection of personally identifiable information. For example, you know, if I am using a drone for you know, forest fire prevention, you know, I should be using that drone in the particular area that's of concern and, you know, for example, turning the drone camera off during the time that it's flying over populated areas where it might incidentally collect a lot of personal information. At least four Washington state agencies told the governor's task force they want to use drones, including the Department of Natural Resources, Emergency Management, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the Department of Ecology. It's the last two on that list that worry Tom Davis of the Washington State Farm Bureau. That's because of their power to write tickets and fines. Farmers feel like they're continually being attacked uh, by both state and federal agencies, air quality, water quality. The Farm Bureau, with 41,000 members across Washington, adopted an anti-drone policy at its 2012 convention. The actual words are, we oppose the use of unmanned aerial vehicles to conduct aerial inspection of farms and ranches unless explicit permission has been granted by the landowner. So we don't oppose drones, we just oppose how they're used in regulatory situations. Like it or not, people in eastern Washington have an inherent distrust of, of specifically the Department of Ecology. They're concerned that, that they're tr trying to make a living, they're, they're following the laws as they understand the laws, and suddenly they have a state agency on their doorstep with a, with a cease and desist order and a $10,000 a day fine because their cows are drinking out of a creek. That's their fear. The Departments of Ecology and Fish and Wildlife both declined interviews with TVW. It's often easier to ask for forgiveness than for permission, and I think that's where we see the, the state agencies at this point. Davis Fish says farmers are not only worried about those two agencies, but also about spying from activist groups, like People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, which released this video encouraging its members to use drones to spy on hunters. 
Farmers, where they manufacture, where they grow the food that we eat, they also live there. So it's, it's them, it's their kids, it's their workers, and so there are a lot of things that they're concerned about just for you know, privacy and safety issues connected to that. You know, where people talk about what's the bag limit for drones or, you know, what kind of buckshot do I have to use on drones? I mean, people are concerned about these and they will do what they need to do to defend their land. Farmers may not want other people's drones over their property. So the camera's up front, see it tilt down. But even the Farm Bureau admits drones could be useful tools for agriculture as long as farmers are behind the controls. My name is David Beck and my wife Jean and I um, operate the Crawford Beck Vineyard. Uh, we do not make wine, we, we grow grapes, which is really an important uh, distinction. We have a 48 acre farm and over those 48 acres are scattered 15 acres of grapes in, in blocks. We have Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, Chardonnay. It takes a lot of labor to, uh, to farm grapes. These grapes go on to make some of the Northwest's priciest wines. And the growers, former scientists who found a new calling in Oregon's Willamette Valley. Both of us um, had laboratories that we, um, uh, that we ran uh, for, for 45 years and decided that uh, the vineyard will be our next laboratory. And like any good lab, he plans to equip it with the best tools. Just like I've got trackers in the barn um, and I've got a sprayer and uh, whatever else I've got, I will have a quadcopter with the, with the tools to enable me to assess and evaluate the uh, progress of the vineyard. We don't use the word drone. Uh, we stay away from that as much as possible because it has a military or a negative connotation. We do use the, the word uh, unmanned aerial system and, and uh, UAS and so that's sort of our our, our, our code word for something that uh, flies under 400 feet and, uh, and is uh, very lightweight and, and uh, doesn't fly in airspace. Uh, so it shouldn't be a problem for anyone, at least of all the FAA, because it's, uh, it's no, nowhere near um, any kind of a commercial airline flight path or anything like that. We uh, are working with a visible camera today and the goal is pretty simple create enough imagery of this uh, vineyard area so that we can create a composite image. This $6,000 quadcopter belongs to Oregon State University, which has permission from the FAA to study how drones could help farmers like Beck. What I'm looking for is a means of evaluating the, um, the vigor of the vines. Are there weak spots? Are there spots that are too strong? Are there spots where the vines need, uh, need help, um, where they need fertilizer, water, whatever it might be. With visual imagery from a typical camera, we're going to see what our eyeballs see. And there's value in that for looking at breaks of patterns and crops. But when we start to use these modified cameras with the infrared to develop the indices, the uh, differential vegetation index that many people that are interested in growing things are interested in, then we start to get a more detailed perspective. So this is a way for us to become much more efficient about agriculture and uh, much more skilled. I think it's going to have a tremendous impact on Washington and Oregon. Once the FAA allows commercial use of drones, 80% of the market is predicted to be for agriculture use. The drones are already widely used in countries like Japan, where farmers use this Yamaha drone to spray fertilizers and pesticides. If you ask somebody, you know, what's the most common drone in use today in the world, they'll probably say the Predator, the Reaper, one of the military ones. No, it's this little Yamaha Armax. It's the Japanese who have been flying domestically to do agriculture work for 25 years. I mean, it makes me ill to my stomach when I hear people talk about, oh, the United States is the most advanced country in the world in terms of flight, and you know, we've got a commanding lead in terms of drones. No, we are. We're behind the game, and we get further behind every single day. I don't think a lot of people understand it yet, but we're in a fight for our lives here. This is the industry of the next 20 years. This is the next Internet. There will come a point where Farmers and others that are involved in producing food or other goods are, are going to own their own systems. It's going to get to the point where it's relatively turnkey. That you go down to Bimart or Costco or some group and you're able to buy something off the shelf. I think we're probably 10 years out on that more turnkey solution. I just can't tell you how exciting it is, the idea that we can just 
go to the closet or whatever, bring the, the quadcopter out, turn it on, power it up, and, and off you go. And you get the information, you pull the SD card out of the camera, plug it into your computer, and you have actionable information. This is truly exciting. In Washington, the future is wide open for farming drones, for Amazon, which says drones will soon be delivering packages to your doorstep. and for dozens of other ideas that are still being developed in labs like this one in Seattle, run by Boeing and the University of Washington. So what we're demonstrating here is sort of the first fundamental pieces of what we call collaborative control. 10 years or so, we look back and look forward and recognize that the future of aerospace is really gonna all involve collaborative control. As Boeing technical fellow John Vian explains, these two flying drones are communicating with each other so they don't collide, while also tracking the ground robot. We're using actual GPS coordinates, so we can overlay everything that you're seeing there on that monitor with actually a Google map. And we can actually use Google Earth and actually run it in a real scenario. So in this scenario, has that bridge collapsed? That bridge has collapsed. We're sending in a robot to inspect the damage, and it's being controlled from somewhere else in the United States. And actually what it's doing now is uh, looking for natural gas leaks. If it detects a natural gas leak, um, the remote operator, along with the UAVs flying, will be able to guide it over to the gas valve. And then with other technology that would be added later, um, it would be able to manipulate the gas valve and, and turn it off. The robot, the UAVs would be able to turn off the gas valve? Yes. Eventually, 10, 20, or even 100 drones could fly at the same time, all working together on the same mission. We're looking at this for actually a factory automation, automated airplane inspection. Using collaborating robots together, whether they're air or ground, we see it's really going to be the future in, in most everything that's done. So rather than a pilot getting out and doing a walk around the airplane, that the robots would be ready to go. Um, they would always be ready. They wouldn't be deterred by bad weather. Um, they would do the, the inspection completely and they'd be able to automatically report it back to an information technology system that will not make any errors in the process. So we see this, uh, the, the multi-vehicle collaboration and autonomy is being pervasive across most uh, all of the systems. As the technology progresses faster and faster, and with FAA regulations months or perhaps even years away, many states are passing their own domestic drone laws. Ten states require police to get a search warrant or judge's approval to use a drone. Oregon prevents weaponizing drones, and Idaho's law also bans anyone from conducting surveillance on people or their property, including farms, without their consent. In Tennessee and Illinois, it's a crime to harass hunters with drones. Virginia put a two-year ban on law enforcement using them. And in Texas, police can use them in suspicious situations, no warrant required. It's also illegal for hobbyists to fly over private property without permission. It really does go to this question of what kind of a society do we want to live in? Washington state is on the verge of passing its own law, but questions remain. We don't want to live in a society, I think most Washingtonians don't want to live in a society where government drones are flying all over the place and they're collecting information and nobody really knows how that information is being used. If you're going to do surveillance on a private individual, you need a warrant. You need a search warrant to do that. We agree with that. But we also do not want to ban the technology where it helps people. So if, if we can use these systems to help find a lost hiker or uh, someone who is uh, severely injured uh, up in the mountains or firefighting and all these other things that we talked about, we should be allowed to do that for the public good. The forest that lies behind all of these trees is the fact that this is war technology. Like drones are wartime technology, and there's a direct parallel between the drawdowns in Iraq and Afghanistan and the militarization of police at home. It's not limited to different drones. It's not limited to drones. It's limited to all different types of weaponry. It's limited to body armor, military vehicles, spying equipment that, aren't, that isn't aerially launched. There's a lot of conversation that people need these technologies in order to effectively police 
and that is a marketing ploy. What we want to make sure happens is that there is a, a respectful dialogue around the, the, the fact that you can, you can use any kind of technology to invade someone's privacy. It doesn't have to be an unmanned aircraft. It could be a helicopter. A news helicopter can do a lot more than what an unmanned aircraft can do. It's perfectly legal for anybody who wants to, either law enforcement, a regulatory agency, or a private citizen, to fly over your house at 500 feet and take pictures of you. And I think everybody generally feels that's probably okay. But on the other hand, if somebody wants to fly a small uh, drone, a small quadcopter, 20 feet over your backyard and take pictures of you in your backyard, or fly it up to your bedroom window and peek in your bedroom window, I think everybody acknowledges that that's not okay. So we're in this place where we need the laws to catch up and to figure out where the boundary is. The message I would give to somebody who's concerned about privacy is, first, if you're in Seattle, uh, go up the Space Needle and try to see everything that's happening in the city below you. Obviously you can't. Now try to put a camera up to that eye and learn how difficult it is uh, to go and spy on people. There's no need for uh, specific legislation pertaining to unmanned aircraft, simply because unmanned aircraft uh, don't offer any unique ability to investigate. Legislators in Washington state aren't going to be as put off by the fact that something has a national controversy attached to it. Washington has taken a pretty provocative stand on individual civil liberties and individual civil rights before. I mean, death with dignity, marriage equality, uh, marijuana legalization, you know, the Washingtonians are not afraid to go first. And to make it happen, lawmakers will be weighing privacy alongside the promise of a new technology, all part of charting a course for drones in Washington.